600 years ago, the ancestors of the Mono Lake Paiute inhabited the Mono Basin. They were known as the Kuzetika. In this harsh environment of sand and rock, their survival depended on an intimate connection to a fragile web of life. Living in the shadows of the Mono craters, they crafted tools from the glassy volcanic rock and hunted game in this plentiful land of the Great Basin. Like the inhabitants before them, their lives were threatened by catastrophic geologic events. mysterious lake, one's attention is drawn to the islands that break its surface. Twice the size of San Francisco, this inland sea holds two islands captive near its center. The Black Island, known as Nejet, is a volcanic cinder cone. Its name means blue-winged goose in the language of the Kuzetika. Paoha, the large light island, is the result of an upheaval of the lake bottom. Here, hot springs allow heated vapors to escape. The legends of the Kuzetika Paiutes tell of spirits with long wavy hair dancing in the vapor wreaths boiling from the springs. They call the spirits Paoha in remembrance of the children of the mist who reveled there on moonlit nights. The Kuzetika Paiutes made the basin home for several hundred years. Their survival in this harsh environment is a story of courage and tenacity. Jessie Durant, a Mono Lake Paiute, recalls her life at the lake. As far back as I can remember, we've always lived in Mono Lake at Rush Creek. And my grandparents, and my relatives, they have never known of living anywhere else. <laughs> to me, thinking about it now, it was really a paradise because there was uh, greenery all around, meadows and trees. We children, when we were small, we were just turned loose. There was no restriction of any kind and we were just all over the place. At that time, I think that there were about 200 Indians living around the lake. During the summer, we would make a little uh, sagebrush little house. And that's the way we would get by during the summer. But during the winter is when we moved to the east side of the lake. Winters in the basins were really hard. The brine fly, or the larvae, was our main food. It was almost every summer when people, or most of the women, went out and gathered the uh, kozabi, the brine fly. We'd get out with our winnowing basket and scoop them up. And first we spread some kind of a material blanket or whatever we have, sheets, and uh, put that right on and let it dry until we're ready to, to go home. The, all the younger generation, I don't think they, they haven't been out uh, gathering it anymore. And it, it saddens me and to see the way things are. And uh, the water has a lot to do with it. It has uh, dried up and a lot of things has disappeared. Out of all the families, uh, there's uh, just the, the three of us left. My uncle and my aunt. So that's all there are. And whenever I visit them, I I like to carry on a conversation in Paiute all the time. Tami tami na a mu asu tami marabui de tu ima marabui de mai kusaba 
Ya wino o nemi mani puni o. Human judgment has often painted this strange land as silent and vacant, a place suspended in time over which only the mirage dances and the sandstorm sweeps. But this grand and haunting country has no need of humankind, yet our dependency on its water has shaped its destiny, a destiny bound to human reason and the whim of nature. And perhaps the grand architect of this enduring, yet fragile aquatic world designed it to mirror our own mortality and planetary fate. Here, we can enter an unknown realm and return with insight to the nature of our own lives. Here, where the seasons leave and return on dry winds, in a land born of ice and fire.